And now for our feature presentation. Enjoy or not. So say good night to the bad guy. Warning, the following program contains scenes of death. What is morality? I guess that's a question that's been asked and argued since the beginning of time. And what constitutes this morality? Right versus wrong. And where do we draw that invisible line? It is a known practice in some countries to take a heavy rock and to seal it into a box that once contained a television set, then resell it, telling people it's a television. And it isn't a crime. It only means that the individual who sold that box with the rock inside is the cunning one. And the one who purchased that box is less so. And they will both be judged in their society as thus. But if I suppose one were to lyrically wax, they may say that at the end of this life, when we pass on into the next world, that of course is if there is one, we will be judged accordingly, not by our rotary adjustable moralities, but by a higher power. And that higher power will then hold sway on how we spend our next eternity. Or at least I hope that's the case, or I wasted five bucks on this book. We all have a perception of ourselves that we carry with us each time we enter into the light. And perhaps it is that perception or deception that gets us through each day. In fact, it was an egghead philosopher who once said that perception was created within our psyche, shrouding us of the true reality within ourselves. And if we weren't shrouded, well, we'd probably kill ourselves. Ah, oh, jeez. Because it is this perception that helps us get through our day-to-day -day lives. And maybe 21-year-old Lucy Blackman had a little bit of that perception slash deception. Young, tall, leggy, blonde. Yeah, I guess she'd appeal to some. But she wasn't no model. But the problem with Lucy was she figured that life owed her more. The first in her class to get tits. Dating an older boy who had a car. She thought she was special. But that don't make you special. That don't make you closer to God. Her family had money, privately educated. And she just landed what some people would consider a coveted job with British Airways. Where she figured she'd get to see the world, do a little partying, eventually meet a rich businessman who'd beg her to marry him. And she popped out a few kids who were all part of a master plan. But Lucy soon discovered that being a trolley dolly wasn't the walk in the park that she thought it would be. Long hours, rude passengers, and she wasn't meeting any rich businessmen. She was serving in economy class. And yeah, sure, some of the guys wanted to get into her shit, but they were never going to be good enough for her. So when her best friend came to her with an idea about becoming escorts in Japan, telling her it weren't as bad as it seemed, because they don't call them escorts there, they called them hostesses. And they wouldn't even need to fuck any of these jokers, because Japs aren't that much into women. Well, they are, but I guess because they got tiny dicks. They don't make the girls put out like the guys do in the West. And her friend promised her that it'd be easy peasy, nothing sleazy. Well, getting something for nothing, that appealed to Lucy. And as soon as they hit Tokyo Airport, they dumped their uniforms in the garbage. And they never looked back. And it didn't take them long to realize that Jap men like eating raw fish just as much as they liked Western pussy. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. 
But I'm not gonna go there, because this is a family show. Chatting a prayer of Buddha into a horse's ear. Although the two young women were in a foreign country, didn't speak a word of Japanese, and only had tourist visas and were unable to work legally, they weren't bothered and they got the cab driver to drop them off in the sleaziest part of town because they didn't need no work visa to pedal what they were going to pedal. Because by all accounts and purposes, the girl's prospects were looking pretty good. Because pussy was big business in Japan and western pussy even bigger and everybody knew the Japanese men were harmless. Sitting on your ass all night, getting drinks bought for you, and all you had to be is a cock tease. When she told her parents, they had no problem with it. They figured if you got it, flaunt it. After all, Lucy'd been doing the same thing back home. The only difference now was she didn't have to put out. And she was starting to feel pretty good about herself. Even broke up with her boyfriend, telling him, it's not you, it's me. But sorry, buddy, I definitely think it was you. The girl's job as hostesses was to flirt with the guests, or salary men as they were known as. Pour them drinks, light the cigarettes, lots of innuendo, maybe brush against their cock occasionally. And in return, the salary men paid the extortionate entry fees and bought the overpriced, watered down whiskey and showered the girls with expensive gifts. Easy peasy. Japanesey. But Lucy's snobby, uptight attitude, well, it didn't sit too well with the salary men. She'd only been on a handful of dojos, but she would never asked out for a second. And who can blame him? I wonder how you say stuck up bitch in Japanese. But her best friend Louise, or Lou, as she was known as, she took the hostessing like a cock sucking a cock. After all, She'd always been the flirtatious one, with a string of lovers wrapped around her little finger. And now she had the salary men showering her with gifts, mobile phones, jewelry, cash. And all she had to do was give out a hand job here and there, milking her clients figuratively and literally. After all, the girls had been competing with each other. Since before they had tits, they'd attended the same private upscale girls' school together, worked at the same bank job, signed up to be flight attendants, and even liked to fuck the same guys. Now they were hand in hand, looking to improve interracial relationships. It was around this time that Lucy were called into the office of her mama-san. The mama-san is usually a former hostess, now too old to do a job, but she's kept around so she can keep the other girls on the straight and narrow. You know, if someone's sucking cock, the club wants to make sure they're getting their cut. Seems the management had a problem with Lucy. Yeah, sure, she looked good. But so did the big wooden Indian at the front door. But at least the wooden Indian held cigars. Lucy was doing nothing but taking up space on the benches and eating the complimentary peanuts. They told her if she wanted to sit on a bench, she should go to the park and feed the pigeons. Because you know, at least then she wouldn't be eating the free nuts. After her one-to-one -one with her mama-san, Lucy were feeling demoralized. Cause this weren't the glamorous life that her best friend had promised her. Living with six other girls in one room, sharing the same toilet, the other girls using her expensive beauty products, working 14, 15 hour shifts with a bunch of sweaty businessmen running their fishy fingers up her sweet thighs. Right now, being on a plane, serving cheap wine to rude passengers didn't seem like such a bad job. But she knew one thing for sure. If she wanted to keep working with her best friend, she better start doing dough hands soon and getting repeat customers. Or she'd be peddling her pussy out in the streets. The job streets. But little did Lucy Blackman know that her next dough hand would be her last. Her 
who were early on July 1st that Lucy told Lou that she would go in on her dough hand with a sweaty man who'd been following her around the club. They were weird, but harmless. But she was excited though, because the man were gonna give her a brand new, top of the line, mobile phone. Lucy wrote in her diary that morning that she enjoyed bragging to her best friend that she were getting a free mobile phone. Because it meant that her pussy tasted just as sweet as Lou's. As Lucy left, her best friend admitted that she had an uneasy feeling. A sixth sense, one would say. Lucy called her an hour later on her Dohan's mobile and told her that her and her sweaty Dohan were going down to the seaside because it was such a beautiful day. We're gonna enjoy a champagne lunch. And Lucy loved a free lunch. Lucy were to make one more call to a friend. It was that night at 7 p.m. She told Lou she were at the sweaty man's luxury apartment at the seaside and had given her a bottle of champagne that she were gonna share with Lou later and that she'd received a top of the line new mobile phone. It was the girl's day off and they were due to go out that night at eight o'clock. Lucy said she'd leave in 30 minutes. But 30 minutes turned out to be an eternity. It were almost seven months to that day later that a family, probably a Japanese family, were out playing on the beach when one of the children wandered into a cave one of many caves in that area. And they found a bathtub that were turned upside down. And when she flipped over the bathtub, they were full of cement. And inside that cement were the head of Lucy Blackman. Looking like a goddamn religious icon. And they also found some garbage bags tied up tightly and then the garbage bags with different pieces of Lucy the foot the wrist an arm and one of those long legs and they'd been in the wet sand for about seven months and they were all translucent like the octopus that those zipper heads like to eat They were in 1992, Tokyo, shortly after midnight, when a young Caucasian woman were brought into a local hospital by a Japanese man. The girl, a 21-year-old Australian wannabe model and hostess, Karita Ridgway, and she was suffering from massive liver failure. The nurses described the man who brought her in as a sweaty man, and he described his drop-off as a good time girl. A hostess that he'd just met and that she'd been doing drugs and eating raw oysters. He then paid a bill in cash and left. Although doctors put the girl's illness down to oyster poisoning, they did note that she'd recently had sex an hour or two before and had severe anal tears. Meaning that if she died from the oysters, she'd been eating them while she were being ass fucked. When Corita's parents arrived from Australia, they thought the daughter had just fallen ill from the oysters. And they removed her from her life support. Her body were cremated 
and reappropriate it to Australia. Easy peasy, Japanesey. In what was seen by many as a controversial turnaround time, Louise Phillips took two days to notify anyone that her best friend had not returned from her Dohan that night. First, she called the police, who weren't interested in a good time girl working illegally in their country. Then second, she called Lucy's parents. Lucy's father, divorced from her mother after he left her for another woman, were a property developer. He had money and connections and came over from England right away, bringing along his new partner and Lucy's younger sister, who looked remarkably like Lucy. But still, when he spoke to the police, he received resistance as they were uninterested in what they viewed as a fallen woman. Because in Japan, connections and money don't buy class. Her a week after Lucy had gone missing, that a friend Louise received a phone call from a mysterious Jap man who said that Lucy had joined the cult and wanted to be left alone. When Louise tried to question this, he hung up. After going to the police about this strange turn of events and them still showing no interest, her father took the case to the media. The thought that she may have suddenly become interested in a religious cult over a Saturday afternoon is very unlikely. He also enlisted friends in PR companies to help change the public's perception of Lucy, because at this point she weren't too endearing. There is a lot of kudos to being seen with a beautiful Western girl, but it's all totally innocent. So I think something that's very, very important to understand is it is absolutely not prostitution. Yeah, it's absolutely not prostitution. The PR spin was simple. Lucy was just a good, pure English girl enjoying a different culture while trying to pay off her credit card debt. A real fairy tale. But whether the Japs were buying it, it's hard to say. But I guess it didn't matter because Tim Blackman were trying to convince the public back in England that his daughter weren't a skank because he had powerful friends and he needed their money to help find her. Because at the end of the day, that's what any loving father's gonna do. So you can't blame him. But it seemed with private detectives and large rewards, no one were getting closer to finding out what happened to Lucy Blackman. Uh, police are looking into it. We had a phone call saying that there was a possibility Lucy might be with other Western girls on a boat on the way to Hong Kong. Um, but equally, we had two uh, reports that on the 30th of June, Lucy was climbing Mount Fuji, and on the 1st of July, she was um, in um, an island south of Japan. So most of the time, it's hoaxes, it's lies, and it's confusion. It were now over two months into the investigation, and there's several things that were hampering it from the start. The most important being the police and Jap privacy laws. Because although both Blackman's PIs and Jap cops believed that phone records could reveal who'd called Louise that day and trace the number that Lucy'd called from on her last door hand, Jap privacy laws, some of the strictest privacy laws in the world, prohibited them from getting those records from the phone company. <laughs> Police had also been using Lucy's diary that they'd found hidden in her apartment to find any clues, and it revealed that she'd been fucking an American soldier at a nearby army base, but he were quickly dismissed as a suspect when it were confirmed that he were on the base when she disappeared. And when police spoke to witnesses and put together an e-fit of the sweaty man seen with Lucy, it added more confusion than anything else. Cause he looked like one of the Muppets had fucked a chocolate bar and had a kid. But it was when British Prime Minister Tony Blair came over and met Japan's Prime Minister that it caused the shitstorm. We'll do everything we can. We're working closely with the Japanese authorities. A Jap shitstorm. And that weren't the kind of shit storm that any country wanted. I'm here today to ask for your help. Uh, Lucy now it seemed that everybody were getting in on the act, and the story of the British hostess had now gone global. 
And with him that the Jap Prime Minister told his cops to pull their fishy fingers out of their ass and start cracking heads and solve the case. And the first thing they did was subpoena the phone records. Fuck the privacy laws. And an anonymous phone line was set up that immediately received hundreds of calls. Telling a story about how they'd been on a Dohan with a sweaty rich man who had a fast car who took them to the coast and drugged and raped them. A man who had a penchant for ass fucking and the girls barely out of their teens all too embarrassed to come forward. It were a veteran detective newly assigned to Lucy's case who were going over witnesses' reports and saw the reoccurring theme of a sweaty man. It was then that he remembered a young pretty hostess who had been dropped off at a hospital almost nine years before with what nurses described as a sweaty man who had also paid for her hospital bill, a large hospital bill, and cash. And now the pieces of the puzzle were starting to fit like a cripple's boot on a cripple's foot. Because what if this sweaty man was the same sweaty man that were going around and drugging and raping other hostesses? And this same sweaty man who went on a Dohan to the seaside with Lucy Blackman. A Dohan of death or lyrically wax. They were in October 2000. Three months after Lucy Blackman had gone missing. Nine years since Corita Ridgeway had her life support turned off. The police approached Yoshi Obara's Tokyo apartment. His name was different each time, but his M.O. were consistent. A sweaty, wealthy man who spoke English well, who took the hostesses out on a dohan to the seaside where he drugged and raped them. The phone records, the ones detectives had finally acquired, were traced back to an expensive phone and the serial number back to the cellar. They said they'd sold a man, a sweaty man, more than 20 of the phones and he'd paid in cash. And those phones were traced back to Yoshi Obara and his address. It was 5 a.m. in the morning when they busted down a borrower's door and arrested him. They wanted to catch him early because if he got in one of his fast sports cars, they knew they'd probably never catch him as he were a millionaire and owned over five properties. He'd be difficult to track down and he could become a ghost if he wanted to become a ghost. One of his properties or a condo and a rundown seaside resort town. The same shitty town where they traced Lucy's last car from and near where they found her body. When they went to that condo in the shitty resort town, they found over 2,000 VHS tapes along with camera equipment. And on those VHS tapes were the rape of over 500 women. As they played through the tapes, and one of those women that they witnessed dying was well, Corita Ridgeway. She'd been drugged using chloroform. And you could clearly see Yoji Obara smiling into the camera as he fucked her in the ass, as she slowly slipped into the abyss. Police never found a video of Lucy Blackman. But they did find clumps of her hair throughout the apartment. And a handwritten journal with over 500 names in it. Including Corita Ridgeway and Lucy Blackman. And under both of their names, he wrote, Too much chloroform.
Legion Forever! <laughs>